Hello everyone, I wanted to update my startup file since it's been, I don't know, not a year but nearly a year since I put out my most recent version of it up on Gumroad and it includes some elements from Afterglow so this is basically what you see when you open it and I really liked it, it's a good starting point for me because it kind of gives me an option over doing stuff that's realistic and it's quite easy to disable things as and when needed I even have my own custom node and the world settings here to kind of control like the world space so if I actually just remove that, that back light catcher there so you have an HDRI and color background node and I can increase the volume density easily if not that if i plug in the surface i can adjust what the background color is which is separate and doesn't affect the light so if i'm doing stylized things i can make sure the background's got a different uh, color to it and if there is an hdri then you can plug that in and control the strength things i want to go back through and just give it a little bit of an update let me make a new version but actually what we on now we're on uh 4.3 me anyway i know there's a newer version available so the first thing i want to do is actually a very small but kind of important change which is that for me when um doing the recordings you know I had the camera in the corner and I need to keep moving it when it's overlapping with something important and I was always thinking ah, oh, it gets a little bit annoying doing that kind of complicates the editing process and I kept thinking what's a way to get around that until it occurred to me an extremely simple solution and I don't know why I didn't think about this earlier that literally if I just crop the editor so there's literally nothing important happening where the camera is then I will never need to move the camera <laughs> oh what a just I've been doing this for five years everyone is it five years five or six years ridiculous so that's the first change i wanted to do my god what a ingenious solution okay so got different camera crop sizes question of how big do i need to be then ideally i suppose the smaller the better let's bring you down a bit there we go although actually it would make sense to keep the width of the startup file the same because i quite like that width so maybe i'll just try and match it to the width it would get a little bit annoying if working with like long uh, modifier lists so so i may need to make some adjustments but i suppose stuff can always be dragged up and down as needed and things can always be collapsed into collections for the outliner okay so let's match the other camera there we go so i'm sure this is absolutely riveting to watch but this is like the kind of technical stuff that i have to do so that solves that problem next up let's just reset that to black with alpha up this node by the way comes with the modular workspaces pack which is down here that's my default that's nice workspaces open and set to open the modular workspaces library close that the compositor my god this is something that was a little bit messy so i've got like versions of bloom for like the viewport and render because things were for some reason not consistent you know but when uh, looking at the bloom in the viewport versus the final render that might be my problem and i always had this technique for um denoise mixing so i can actually give an example of that so let's say we render this that's on 300 samples do i want to keep it on that is 300 okay Denoise is off by default because I, again, I do the denoising in the compositor. Okay, well, let me cancel that there and just look at this. So we've got some noise, obviously. So the basic output from the render is what we're seeing. The denoised output looks like this, so it's extremely smooth. But oftentimes it gets a bit too smooth and too smudgy. So what I do is I mix the original output with the denoised output. And what that does is it gives you a percentage control between the the two options. Obviously this takes a bit of time because the denoising the compositor takes time to calculate. So it'd be a little bit annoying if you're doing it for an animation, right? But it means that you can get, in my mind, a better quality render result by leaving a tiny bit of noise in it. So I tend to keep the value on 0.8. You can always like turn it back down and you see more of the noise come in. Now I haven't done like video animations in Blender for a long time. So I don't know how well that works for that. I mean, it'll probably be fine, but I rely on that quite a lot. I wonder if I could or should node group that. Maybe I will, because it would just tidy things up a bit. So we got the denoise, the mix, we want the factor to be the percentage. Let's go, what we're doing, group, fact, let's call that percent. So it's between zero and one. So if we go back up, we got the node group there. And we should call it something like denoise mix. Something like that seems appropriate. So now the denoise mix, if I adjust it, is gonna give us the control between something noisy and something smooth. So how can I clean this up more? Maybe one of you will have an answer for this. Let's test the bloom because this is just getting a bit annoying now. And I find that when I have my complex files like Afterglow, I end up in such a mess because, let me see if I can actually open one. I'll to be honest, that's not too bad. I've clearly cleaned that up for this one. But I would end up in a situation where I have like, um, see Studio Environment 5, Studio Environment 5. So we got a viewpoint, a render version, but then there'd be like one for every different studio environment as I was testing. So I'd end up with like tons of node groups like that. But obviously you will make bloom adjustments depending on, you know, the scene because the lighting is so different. But it all just stems from the fact that for some reason they're not consistent. Now I'm sure, like I am no doubt, it's my mistake here. The method I was using for Bloom is actually by combining two fog glows together because one fog glow by itself is too... Sorry, I'm opening a can. 
was too basic, too simple, too uniform. And I think I picked this up from someone on Blender Artist. I'm not sure. So let's try and take a look at that. If I go back to the render, I'll make sure we disable use nodes. That's another thing. There we go. If we've got the denoise happening, then uh, we don't want to tick use nodes. Otherwise, the viewport will slow down. So I plugged in the viewport bloom. Are we actually seeing that at the moment? Yeah, I've got it on camera. That's fine. So let's try and adjust the light to give us a visible bloom. Would it make more sense to remove the background like that? And then make sure I tick use nodes again. Okay, so let's see what we're looking at here. If I just take... I mean, we're going to discover whether I'm, I was actually right about this or not, because it may be the case that I'm just overthinking it by using more than one fog glow. I'm sorry if the node's small, by the way, you can see here I'm plugging in a glare and we're going to have a little investigation of this. So we got the glare there with the weird like right angle bloom effect. Oh, and I know that people have done like all different kinds of complex bloom products, but the thing is, this is my startup file, right? So I don't want to use anyone else's. So the node groups have to be mine. Oh, there's literally a bloom. See, I didn't know that now. When did they add the bloom? So we had the fog glow, which was a bloom in and of itself. When did bloom appear? See, this is good. That's why we're doing this. But is it what I want? Is it what I like? We'll do a comparison. Okay, Google AI says the bloom option was not directly added as a separate node, but rather became accessible through the glare node within the compositor with the bloom being one of the available glare types. This is kept to release of Blender 4.2. Okay, so that is recent. And I probably mentioned it whenever I did the release video, but just didn't realize. Sweet. Okay, so the size here is going to be like an iteration step, isn't it? And then the threshold. Yeah, I like that. It's like a fairly well-made bloom node. There's no one single way to do bloom. Um, if it seems like I'm like pretentiously overanalyzing it. Quality low to high, only subtle. It's noticeable more along the surfaces. Is there like, a, again, a kind of step thing going on there? I'm not too sure. Hard to tell, a bit of a harsher cutoff from the looks of it on high, but I think that's, yeah, maybe more to do with the mix. But there's no like, there's no intensity. Yeah, I suppose that is, yeah, I guess that is mix from negative one upwards. Okay, so look, we got the old viewport bloom and we got the new bloom. Let's try and match them a bit. Viewport, new. Okay, let's observe that corner there. Viewport, does it adjust based on how far I'm zoomed in? Yes, it does. Let's say, but go about here, new. The new one, the bloom feels like it has a bit of a harsher cutoff around the edge. Do you see what I mean? Like. My one with the two fog glows feels a bit more faded, but maybe I can actually change that if I like increase the size, whoops, and then slightly decrease the bloom. The old one is still good, but it kind of reminds me of um, like space renders. Whenever we've seen like renders set in space, is uh, we tend to see the renders with like very high energy, but like small bloom shapes. And I think the kind of logic behind that is that it's a vacuum, there's no atmosphere, and it's direct sunlight in the vacuum. So the reflectivity is insane on like white surfaces. So the light bounces off, hits the camera, and that's, that, that's a lot of photon packets. But it also means that there's nothing to kind of blend the bloom off of, like when you're looking straight against a black background. So I kind of want to keep both. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to make this file available for you. It'll be on the most recent startup file on Gumroad. So let's just take a quick look at that actually while we're here. La 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 la. Oh, shameless plug. Okay, Curtis Hall. So Blender Startup File 4.0. I originally put this one out when I was raising money to see a professor at an eye hospital for my corneal neuralgia problem because I needed to make a bit of money and I hadn't finished off at the time. So I sold this for $20 and a lot of you supported and that was very sweet. So thank you very much for that. But I feel like, you know, I should stick with this. I should stick with it as a product rather than just do it as a one-off thing. I'm going to keep it updated for you. So what we're doing now is me kind of improving this for you. So if you want to get it, that's where it will be. And I'll probably need to update this because it's not just for the raising funds for the medical fees anymore but if you want to think about it that way i don't think i've spoken about this yet i mean maybe i have depending on how the videos are going i'm re-entering education and i'm going to be studying medical science for biomedical science now i've always got medical appointments coming up so if it doesn't go towards any medical appointments the income will go towards my education so let's get back to work and also you know after close a fun product so we'll keep both. We will keep the old versions and I will call them the space bloom. Um, clear values are inconsistent. Between oh yeah, we should test whether the new ones are consistent. No idea why, but I will need to find a solution. So look at, I just left these nodes here. Let's get rid of those. And we don't need these plugged in at the moment, right? Let's change the name to space viewport bloom and space render bloom. I'm gonna widen it a little bit. So the names are there, just to make it nice and tidy for you. And yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay, now for the moment of truth. So we want to see whether the degree that the bloom is coming out of the surface is the same between the viewport and the render. And I mean, it should be, right? If this is the default node, 
than we would expect it to be. I like the values I've set and we can keep those as default values now with the low mix, the slightly higher threshold and the size seven. I'll tell you what would be nice if, we, if blah, 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 if we could have something like chromatic in the, the color of the bloom slightly, like almost like um, light is prismatic as it's bouncing off the surface. We can look into that in the future. Maybe I should ask Smouse about that. But, you know, there's not many inputs and outputs on this node, so we'd have to like blend it with another one. All right, never mind. Let's just get a render quickly. Oh, it's showing the light catcher. Hang on, hang on. Cancel that. There you go, disable that in the render. All right, so it should try to apply it any second now. There we go. What I'm gonna do, split the interface, one in the 3D. Is that the same? Is it the same? If we're measuring the distance between like here and here am i going mad or is it slightly stronger on the render there or is that just a symptom of the fact that this is pixel based and this is like vector based if that makes sense i think it's pretty close i think it's close enough it doesn't matter i think the difference is better than it was before so let me show you all right so what we're doing now is a viewport comparison and we just need to wait for that to finish rendering oh no it does look the same so did they fix it I suppose camera position has something to do with it as well. Do you know what? I think they might have fixed it. I say for the sake of consistency and simplicity, we stick with the new glare node and we keep that as the default. So I will be happy with that. So we've got a denoise mix and we've got a glare and I will rename it to glare loom. Now, because I will probably forget that mix is the actual intensity in quotes, I wonder whether I should add some kind of... Uh, Oh no, yeah, I can't input it. Yeah, I would have done like a kind of a nicer control slider thing, but I can't input a value there, that's a shame. So that's what we'll leave the compositor as for now. Just nicely tidied up. So we've got our weld nodes and we've got our compositor nodes. Let's bring the light catcher back. The bloom is active at the moment now as well. I mean, it looks quite nice, quite ethereal, realistic, like a little metal cube going on. I could just as well be spinning some jewelry around. That brings us on to materials. What materials do we have in here? Oh, we've got all sorts and they're kind of weirdly named. Dot zero zero ones, the F character. Wait, hold on. Ah, that one shouldn't be in here. The character one with the fake user. What are you doing here? It's a missing data block. Ah, yes. I can see what's going on. This is an experimental material that I guess I just left in the file when working with Afterglow. You can see these scan lines here. Might be a bit difficult to see, but there are a bunch of missing data blocks uh, because it wasn't supposed to be left in. So let's set that to be deleted. Okay, so lighting collection wise, we've got the studio cage objects. Not all of them are visible because we've got some that aren't visible here. Um, I noticed when doing a recent video that people might prefer a subtle change to how the lighting's done in this. And I believe it was, if I just click on that, was it a matter of reducing the ambient light slightly? I think it was better to keep the top one active. Hang on. I'm basically just making some lighting changes. Studio cage, upper light is what I'll call that. So that one will stay the same and the rest of them I think will reduce. So we get like a strong top light. And by doing this, we effectively reduce the ambient lighting. Yeah, so it lets people kind of gradient between something light and then something really moody like that. I think by default, I'll leave it at like a midpoint-ish. If you're wondering what the character says, it says, replace me for I am not a piece of art, which is, you know, ironic. Feels quite nice spinning this around as well. So that's the cochlea, my inner ear. I think that's my right inner ear. So from behind, it will look like that. With the semicircular canals. I've actually got that here as well, 3D printed. And I call it product viz, but it's Suzanne for this one. I think I call it product viz because kind of that's the center of the studio cage. So that's where you will expect to scrutinize the object with the lighting. And actually, let's just see how that reduction on ambient light looks. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, lots of ambient light, reduction on the light while keeping the strong light above. So yeah, if you want to use this as a starting template, and if you have access to the file via the Gumbard product, hopefully that'll be handy. And um, what this should also mean is now we've separated the rest of the lights from the top one, then we should be able to get mixed color because we'll have like the top being white and the rest being something else. So see here, like a bit of an orange undertone, a bit of a red undertone. Yeah, I imagine jewelry will look really nice here. So you have like a white light for the jewelry and then an, an undercolor. Yeah, that'd be good. So with each of the templates on the top left, sorry, top right, there is a camera that has been placed appropriately for that template. Some of them are in the same place, but like if I go to the camera cube, you see it's a bit further back. Uh, let me set that to a, a nice rotation. 
There we go. So we've got now we've got a little bit of bloom, got a bit of lighting change, tidied up the nodes a bit. Let's actually take a look at the materials. So I had this AO gradient thing on a whole bunch of materials that came with Afterglow. And what it does is, as you can see, it does a gradient where we can adjust from having the influence of ambient occlusion to having no ambient occlusion. And the reason for that is because in some circumstances, if I take a look here, it can look good, notice around the neck and the arms, having a gradient where AO is influenced and we control it with the add value there. It's a little bit difficult for people to understand sometimes, Having something shadowed entirely looks a bit unconvincing, but having it only appear in a few places can be handy for certain effects and certain camera positions. This is applied to the default object everywhere. I don't suppose it needs to be applied to the cube, really, but I still think it's interesting. Obviously, the color ramp can dictate the gradient of the effect. So I'm going to leave it on there for now, but it's just worth noting. I really like how that viewport looks. It's so, I don't know, metallic and pristine. And the bloom is giving it, you know, a kind of slight faded smooth look to it, but quite nice. All right, looks like my main camera's overheating now because I've gone for a little while. So we're going to seamlessly swap to the other one. Sick. Let's let that cool down. I know this is a bit of a long video. I don't usually do like longer work with me things, but uh, I'll say we won't do too much more. So it's like the lower section of the shader controls, the color, maybe it'd be nice if I could explain that to people a bit more. So that's for the AO section. Let's make a frame, call that AO region. Let's just see how this interacts. No, I don't like how that color is controlled. What happens if I just put another mixed color afterwards? Yeah, that will give a tint on the whole thing. So maybe that's a bit more appropriate. I don't perfectly understand what I'm doing at the moment, but I'm just playing around. I'm kind of liking the feeling of this kind of like color burn of some kind. So maybe I'll just leave it like that. There's still other areas to look at as well. Uh, maybe I won't do that just yet. So we've got like a default studio environment actually sitting in the file. And oh my God, we've got a whole bunch of gradients and stuff to play with. Oh, this is before I even finished working on, on uh, these setups. So that's there anyway. But for us, we will keep the default as the cube. So then to also save this as my startup file, default save. Yep, maybe I'll zoom in a bit. There we go. So I'll get that uploaded as the new version in case you want to play around with it. And then I'll move on to something else for now. If you made it this far through this rather long video, put some kind of box related emoji in the comments and I'll see you next time.